Hello and welcome to Switzer TV Property. I'm Peter Switzer. On tonight's show, a property tax expert tells us the mistakes that investors make that could wipe out their tax deductions. And if you do it using an offset account, I've got one word for you, don't. We test whether the reclaiming and restoring of inner city suburbs, often called gentrification, will actually go into reverse with Callum Fraser. And then the buyer's agent from the block, Greville Paps, tells us what's going on in the Melbourne market right now. Are property prices really rebounding? And that's the show for tonight. So let's kick off by talking to Michael Carruthers, the tax expert who has a lot of warnings around tax deductions and investing in property. Well, a lot of people go into property investing because of the what they think is the tax advantage of doing so. Michael Carruthers, who's tax director at the Knowledge Shop, says this can be a tricky terrain. Michael, thanks for joining us. No problem. Thanks for having me. Um, look, it can be a tricky area and um, government initiatives, I guess, over the last few years have actually made things more difficult than they used to be. Um, the rules are already complex enough as they were, and we do find that there's some pretty common traps that people fall into where they can actually make pretty, what they think are small mistakes, but can have a pretty long lasting and significant outcome and impact on their tax position. Um, and one of the things, particularly when it comes to things like interest expenses on loans, is that if you get something wrong at the start, there may be no way of fixing that up basically for the life of that lo the loan or the time you hold that property. Okay, so give, so give us an example of how a mistake could happen that would have serious consequences. Yeah, look, a really simple example and quite a common one actually, and it, it trips up a lot of investors and accountants as well, is just understanding the difference between a redraw facility on a loan and how an offset account works. Mm. Um, if you're taking money out of an offset account, um, that's basically you using your own savings. You're not actually borrowing money, even though taking the money out of the offset account might increase your interest expense on your loan account. Um, whereas if you redraw money from a loan account, you are basically borrowing more money. That's a, that's a new borrowing. Mm -hmm. And the golden rule when it comes to interest expenses in the tax world is you always have to look at what the borrowed money is used for. Mm -hmm. So if you have a loan account that you use to buy your private residence, you've got some money sitting in an offset account, you then take the money out of the offset account and buy a rental property, um, the borrowed money was used to buy your private residence. You're using your private savings to buy the rental property, uh, you are not going to get interest deductions on, I guess, that loan account. Um, whereas had you put the money into the loan account and then undertaken, a, say, a redraw, mm -hmm. um, that is now a new loan. And okay. when you use that to buy the rental property, that interest can be deductible. Okay, so the simple rule for people to understand is that if you're going to use the equity, say, for example, in your principal property, and you, you want to be able to effectively get a loan off that by redrawing off that equity, you don't do it out of an offset account, you do it out of a redraw facility, and then it's tax deductible. Yeah, exactly right. Now, look at does depend, you need to look at it pretty closely because some people will actually want to buy a new property that will become their private residence and they'll rent out the existing property that used to be their home, in which case we need to look at that a little bit differently. But if you're buying a new property that is going to be used for investment, for rental purposes, then interest deductibility will generally come when you redraw money, whereas if you're using money in the offset account, as you say, normally that won't be deductible. Okay, imagine there's someone watching this and you've instantly given them a nightmare heart attack because that's what they've done and their accountant or tax agent hasn't picked up on it because they haven't asked enough questions. What can they do about it? Um, well, this is where it, why it's such a tricky area and why we need to get the advice up front because there isn't much you can do about it. Now, technically, if you've been claiming deductions that you're not entitled to, you probably have to amend your tax returns and you might owe some money to the tax office. There actually isn't an easy fix to that. Um, it's not like you can go and refinance that loan and fix up the tax position. You might get a lower interest rate, but it's not going to fix up the deductibility issue. And that's why I said it's one of those things that you need to get it right from day one 
because you may never be able to fix it if you don't get it right from the start. Yeah. Um, have you come across many people who've fallen into this trap and didn't know until they were alerted by either a well-trained accountant or someone like you? Uh, yes, that happens all the time. Wow. Yeah. Because offset, offset accounts are really popular, so you can imagine why it, it does happen. Uh, Michael, I think a lot of people also muck up the rule around, I own a house, um, I'm posted overseas or posted in a state, and I then rent out my, my home, and uh, they figure that there's a, a, a free period where they can do something like rent out their private home without being affected by capital gains tax. Give us the, 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 the real rule so people fully understand it. Yeah, well, this is an area where there have been some changes quite recently. Um, and so there could be quite a significant difference between you, say, being posted in, interstate within Australia or being posted or moving overseas. Um, and so what the government has done quite recently is said that if you are a non-resident for tax purposes, at the time you sell your property, then the exemption that you would normally get on selling your private home won't apply to you and it won't apply at all. So it's not like you get a partial exemption, you will miss out completely. And that's been a pretty controversial change. It kind of feels quite harsh. Yeah. Um, but so that's an area that people need to be very careful about, that if you do get posted overseas and you're overseas and you sell your property, your Australian property that was your home maybe for 18 years, um, if you're a non-resident for tax purposes at that time, the fact that it was your home for all those years won't count for anything and you often taxed and taxed quite heavily on that. Now, leaving that aside, um, there is a rule that says if you move out of your home and it stops being your main residence, um, you can choose to continue to treat it as if it was still your main residence from a, a capital gains tax point of view. Um, if you're renting out the property, you get a six year period. So it can continue to be exempt from capital gains tax for six years. Um, if you sell the property within that six year period, potentially you could sell that tax free. Mm -hmm. um, alternatively, you could move back in, that resets that six year period. So you could be out of the property for five years, move back in for a couple of years. You might then get another opportunity somewhere else that you take, but you might be away for another four years. Well, you, you've reset that 60 period, so yeah. you can potentially still access that exemption. All right. um, but as I said, we need to be very careful in terms of tax residency status because yeah. it didn't used to be a problem, but it is now okay. quite an issue. So, Michael, uh, I'm trying to think like the person who's watching this saying, oh, my God, I could get caught out here. So if you are posted overseas and you do rent out your private property, it seems to me the really big rule is don't sell it while you're not paying tax here. You're better off just keep renting it and renting it until you eventually come home and start paying tax here again. Then you sell it and you, 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 you will avoid the capital gains tax issue, provided it's, you, have, you do it within six years. If they go over the, 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 into the seventh year, do you, do you only pay capital gains tax on the seventh year or on the whole seven? Look, really simply, you're only then exposed on that extra year. Okay. So if you have rented it for seven years, um, you can still have an exemption for the first six of those years. Mm. And that seventh year is the one that's effectively exposed. Now, it, it's a bit tricky in terms of how you actually do the calculation, mm. um, but you, you don't get hit with tax on the full seven years. Now, again, that assumes that you have become an Australian resident before you sell. So yeah, look, Again, didn't used to be such a problem, but these days, those sorts of decisions now become very important. Yeah. And so, so is what I said right then, if you are posted overseas, don't sell your house while you're paying tax overseas. Keep renting it until you get home, then sell it when you're, when you're paying tax here, and then you won't have a capital gains tax problem, apart from maybe if you go over the six-year six uh, time limit. Yeah, well, look, purely from a capital gains tax point of view, and there's obviously other things to take into account. Yeah. We don't do this sort of thing in isolation. But, yeah, from a capital gains tax point of view, that, that's right. And I guess the two main options there to protect that position are, well, you might sell the property before you leave. Yeah. Um, but timing can be a bit tricky there. You know, if it's on the market and it doesn't actually sell until 
the day after you leave or you could end up uh, with a pretty nasty tax bill. Um, but, yeah, the other option would be to hang on to it, whether you rent it out, whether you let family and friends stay in it for a while, whatever it is. But as long as you are still you still hold it until after you come back and establish your residency again, then, yes, your capital gains tax position can be much, much better. Okay. Is there any other sort of standout big mistake that people make that you'd like to scare my audience with, um, Michael? I never like to scare people, but it is worth... <laughs> you are doing it, by being the way. Aware. It's <laughs> worth being aware. I know they don't want to do it, but you're doing it. But go on. Yeah, but. yeah. Um, and I apologise for that. Um, <laughs> but the other thing that the ACO has picked up on, which is a really valid point, is again, particularly around property and refinancing, um, and particularly when interest rates are moving, you know, it's the sort of time when people think about refinancing loans to get a better deal. Um Refinancing our rental property loan, that of itself from a tax point of view isn't necessarily an issue. Um, where people though do get themselves into a bit of trouble, and the HO is picking up on this, is where someone refinances that rental property loan but borrows a bit extra and then uses that for the holiday or the car or whatever it might be. Yeah, okay. Uh, that now makes your tax position more complicated. Um, you need to apportion your interest expense. Um, you're only, you know, only getting a partial deduction on that ongoing interest expense. And it kind of, it complicates things from that point onwards um, yeah. in terms of repayments need to be apportioned as well. Yeah. So you, you, you're finding yourselves into a bit, you know, a bit of a tricky situation there. So that, that's an area that the ATO is um, quite aware of and focusing on right at the moment. Yeah, and once again, if you have a, only a very like once a year relationship with your tax agent, he or she might not ask the questions like, did you borrow any extra, which is not related to this investment property? And therefore, in a sense, they, they, haven't, they haven't made a mistake, they just haven't investigated sufficiently, and you could be caught out in relation to the tax office. Exactly right, yeah. And an accountant, if you, know, if you don't tell them that sort of information, it may be difficult for them to pick up. Right. Um, look, asking those questions up front, you know, having that chat with your accountant, advisor, uh, before you do anything like that, um, that's always the best the best approach. Okay. Michael, thanks for joining us. We'll catch you up in the not too distant future. I like your scariness. It's good. Great. Thank you. Glad you appreciate it. <laughs>
into a kind of revitalised CBD. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, Melbourne and Sydney both talking, you know, about uh, the creative um, lot role that the city has in our lives. So the restaurants, the bars, the footpaths, the kind of, you know, the, the business of the city is in this creative cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. You know, Sydney, they're talking, I think, 24 hours. Um, uh, Melbourne, um, we've, they've cut a lot of red tape to kind of reactivate the city with our food and beverage premises. And, you know, that I think as an entertainment structure is increasingly a central role of the city. Mm. Now, you guys have um, developed a post-COVID architecture platform. <laughs> so, so I've got to ask you, what in the hell is that? <laughs> and what are the biggest findings from having something like that? So we believe that um, COVID-19 has brought forward about 20 years of health planning into our build building stocks. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, for instance, what it's really shown is that there's, um, there's a, a tremendous porosity of external people coming into buildings in an unregulated way. Yeah. And we don't think that will be able to continue. So, I mean, at the basic um, basic component, we think that there will have to be um, health screening and um, questionnaires in a kind of um, airlock, if you like, that sits adjacent to the kind of building entries and that once people um, have navigated through that kind of screening process, um, that the, the building will then become open to them. So we need to filter the external world to create a safer environment inside the buildings. Yeah. It also seems to me, Callum, that... Uh, and and uh, this occurred to me because, unfortunately, I, I lost my mum last year and she was age 88 and she, uh, she was you know, in a, a retirement home and she always had a respiratory challenge and she got the flu and, uh, and a lot of older people in retirement facilities do die of the flu. And before coronavirus, I think a lot of family members would show up to see their, their beloved family members, not even worrying about the fact that they got the flu or whatever, because it was like a, something we never thought of before. Now with coronavirus, I think none of us will ever go to see a, a family member in a retirement home without a mask if we've got the flu or we wouldn't even do it. The same thing could easily happen, couldn't it, in office blocks in the sense that there are disposable masks to, to actually use when you're going into an elevator, uh, particularly during the winter uh, and flu season. Um, there are other things that we're doing also, um, Peter, to, um, to you know, uh, relieve that need. I think, um, uh, for instance, in our public areas and buildings, we're, we are supplying 100% fresh air. Mm. So you asked me what our post-COVID platform is. It's to make the buildings healthier and safer. And um, so we don't recirculate air in the common areas anymore. It makes you feel better. You're brighter, you're sparkier because you've got a bit more oxygen. Yeah. And, um, and there's no, no risk of exchange. Yeah. Um, but there are other great things. Like, uh, for instance, we're, we're renovating a hotel in Melbourne at the moment with uh, photocatalytic coatings on the tiles. Um, so the photocatalytic coating you can't see, um, but essentially combined with um, light, it creates a sterile surface, mm. right? So the virus cannot live on. So there's some changes that we're making to the materials that we're making our buildings out of so that viruses can't live on the surfaces. And it's just making them, you know, a lot more organised, a lot better cleaned mm. and, um, and a lot safer to be in. Okay, well, let me give you another um, uh, observation that Bernard Salt made when I was interviewing him. He said a lot of the, the restaurants that are famous in the urban areas of places like uh, Turax and Kilda, Pennington, Wallara, um, uh, uh, places around, um, I guess, New Farm in, in Brisbane, places like that, these restaurants are very cosy and people are close together. He says they will, pro they will not be popular and he kind of implied forever. I, I didn't necessarily agree with him on that, but what, what's your view? Do you think there will be a, a, a different attitude towards the, the cosy, intimate, coffee type um, uh, getaway that you're, you're seeing a lot of your wonderful Melbourne? Yes, I think that um, consumers um, uh, will want to manage their own personal space and have a bit more room around them. Mm. That's people my age, um, Peter, but you know, it's not one. But young, um, people, young people like you, yeah. 
I've been I've been watching the younger people in the um, in the beer gardens of the hotels, and they are literally piled all over each other, cards <laughs> with no masks, drinking, smoking, yelling, and um and I just see um you know how bottled up young people have been for nine months, yeah. and uh, and how much they need that kind of social interaction. But what, why is it so hard for Westerners to be so unwilling to do? what the people in Hong Kong do. You know, they've had uh, pandemic challenges forever. They just whack on the mask and they go about their life. We seem to think it's, it's something that we Westerners aren't prepared to do for, uh, for God knows what reasons. Well, primarily they're wearing masks there for air quality reasons. Hmm. You know, it's, a, it's just not safe. No. Um, uh, but, you know, we're very blessed in Australia with such, um, uh, you know, such a clean, natural environment. Hmm. And such, um, well, well, until the bushfires last year, um, you know, in Melbourne, we haven't seen kind of air pollution indexes um, uh, rising at all. So um, I think, I think um, that is part of a future, but hopefully not part of our future, Peter. Okay. Um, you know, when everybody's wearing a mask, the problem is you can't tell who anybody is. <laughs> That's true. One, one last question. And I, we have a mutual friend in Tim Gurner. I know Tim has a project, well, I think putting about seven different uh, apartment blocks in a street in, in Collingwood. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he seems to be recreating like a meat packers or Manhattan type uh, landscape. And I just could not imagine anyone not wanting to live there. Uh, <laughs> and of course, he hates you if you said you know, it's going to fail. But from that, that's part of the reason why I'm talking to you. I, I just think that this gentrification trend of, you know, resuscitating areas that once were called urban blight, I don't think this is going to be, um, uh, will disappear. What's your view? Um, I think that we're really missing the kind of uh, 80,000 people that used to live in the CBD in Melbourne um, who have gone back overseas. Mm. Um, so we, we, the culture of our city, the life of the whole thing needs that kind of... Um, a temporary population, if you like. Um, without that, so for the next couple of years, I think that um, the city is is going to um, regenerate its ground floor environments to have a bit more space and a bit less pressure. And like you say, the rental, the cost of rental accommodation, we think will come down over the next couple of years. But that won't be for long. Yeah? People love the city. The city is kind of fulfilling really important social um, uh, aspects um, for all of us. And I think there's going to be a big return to the CBD um, mm. as people realise just how valuable that is mm. to their frame of mind, to their general health and well-being, and to their kind of love of life. Yeah. And it's, it seems to me that those pesky millennials who hang around mm. pubs together really close, they're the ones who will be snapping up the bargains if there are <laughs> bar bargains in the inner cities of Sydney and Melbourne. <laughs> well, they, they, might, they might be the alarmists sitting in the background. <laughs> but, um, I think for people like me, we're really looking forward to the city opening up and, um, and having that kind of life, um, uh, you know, that creative life, the galleries, the food, the kind of um, the bars, the yeah. kind of chaos of the city. God, I missed that, Peter. Yeah, that's right. It, it just goes to prove that you're a 24 gold carat yuppie, just like <laughs> Callum, Callum Fraser, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. With Melbourne opening up, thank God, after the problems they had with the coronavirus, the question I have is, what's going on in the property market? Someone who's got his hand on the pulse of uh, Melbourne's property market is Gribble Paps, uh, who's the chair of WPB Group. Thanks for coming on the program, mate. Thanks, Peter. All right, now, Gr yeah. Yeah, go on. I was just going to say, we, 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 to your comment there, we are, we, we, we've come out of, the, out of the blocks pretty strong. Yeah. So c can you give me an idea of the, the kinds of indicators that you see that justifies this um, assessment of yours that were coming out of the block strongly. You know what? I think last time we spoke, we were, we were talking. We were in COVID lockdown, and you know, and and what a, a month or two later, it, it, it's turned around. I can't believe that, that how quickly it's turned around. And so all of the conditions 
We have record low interest rates that, that we know. We know that there's been a, a restriction, uh, a, re, a, a more relaxation of the of the, the Royal Commission findings. Uh, we have this pent up demand, and I think the drive right now is that people can see Christmas. And after this weekend, there's only five weekends until Christmas. Mm. So all these people that have been, you know, pent up demand, it's now a massive, you know, this fear of missing out. It seems. Mm. Um, and, and that is providing an absolute rush right now. And uh, it, it is very hard for me as a buyer's agent to, to buy property. It must be hard for my valuation company, WBP, to, to, to value property because it's so, – so it's these conditions um, I think are going to continue. I think they're going to continue into, into next year. And I, I, I think unchecked. Now, we could be talking about a price bubble, Peter, in, yeah. in three years' time. Yeah. So what do you see in terms of the supply of properties on the Melbourne market right now? There's, there's a shortage. I actually – I'm looking for a, uh, an expat client who's, who's in New Zealand at the moment looking for a property um, in, in, the, in Melbourne's southeastern suburbs, five-bedroom house between, you know, three and $5 million. There's actually – 24 houses that fit that criteria across about eight suburbs of Melbourne. Mm. So there's, there's an acute shortage of family homes that are available for sale. So that's driving this this this, this market. Um, and it's, you know, there's some, I'm seeing some crazy prices. Mm. Um, we're, they're not even going to auction. Yeah. These so, are selling, selling in the first week, 10 days of a campaign. So, so that's a supply shortage. Now, you're a buyer's agent. How many customers are banging on your door saying, find us a property? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, uh, you know, I, I've, got, I've got probably at any one time 20 or 30 that I'm working with and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to find. It, it really is hard to find um, property for them and particularly now we've had this, this time pressure before Christmas. What, one, of, one of the interesting observations that I've, I've made is that I've been – We've had this situation where the market has been driven by first home buyers and by owner occupiers. I'm now just slowly starting to see investors are looking at this market and, and they've been completely absent. They haven't been in this market at all. Um, but that is going to put more fuel on the fire when investors start to come in and start competing with first home buyers. And we haven't I haven't seen that for, for a few years. Now, now, Gravel, a lot of people were worried that the pullback in immigration because of the coronavirus restrictions was going to be you know, terrible for rental vacancies and rents and whatever. But then along comes a number which I it's quite surprised me a couple of weeks ago that something yeah. over 400,000 expats have come home. Now these people are going to be either tenants or buyers of property uh, in, in, you know, in, over the next year or so. Are you seeing any evidence of that? Peter, I, I, look, I can't, I can't believe. I've, I've just bought for a, uh, a, a couple in Singapore. I, I'm, I'm acting for one in New Zealand at the moment. Yeah. I, I've got, an, I got another one from, um, from Boston. I, I, I just don't know where, where they're all coming from. Yeah. But they, they, I've had more expat um, people that wanting to buy back in, 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 in Melbourne. And, and I suppose why wouldn't they? When you look at the way that Australia has, has handled themselves in, in, in this crisis mm. compared to other parts of the world, you know, we're the greatest, greatest country in the world and the way that we've, we've, we've handled this uh, mm. COVID crisis. And, and do you think a, a part of it also is the fact that, you know, historically, I think it was the, the 2019 year, we Australians spent $69 billion in overseas travel. Now, that money's not being spent overseas. It's being spent here. And do you think some people are actually looking at upgrading their homes as a consequence of the fact that they, they have a lot more cash flow at the moment? Yeah, they, they do have more cash. And when you think about it, you can borrow a million dollars for 20K, mm. right? Now, this is creating a lot of... Um, increased affordability. So whereas before buyers could might have had a limit of X amount of dollars, 
you know, their buying capacity now has just shifted and elevated higher and higher. Um, so that's that, that's 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 part of the, the drive of this this the availability of money in in the marketplace and, and the ability to 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 get it now um, is is what I'm saying. It's fueling this strength in the market, and I think it's going to continue as investors. So this is the other thing I touched on before: is these investors are coming back in. Mm. Um, that they used to represent thirty about thirty. Plus, well, at one stage, I think in Sydney it was forty percent of the market at one point in time. They're, they're now down into the probably, you know, 10, 10 to twelve percent. But once they come back, um, and they will, because what, what else you know better than most? What, what, what do you do with your money? Like cash is burning a hole in your in your pocket. Mm. You know, it's, some people feel you know that the, the share market, but is that fully valued? But you know, like the safety of bricks and mortar. I mean, store of value assets like that, I, I think with, with low inflation, low interest rates, can only rise um, in, in this environment and you have the stimulus as well. Mm. In-street auctions in Melbourne, are they back on the uh, agenda or are they st- still being done online and restricted? No, no, we're, we're, we're back to, to, to the auctions, although we can, we can only have 10 people yeah. um, uh, physically at, at an auction. Uh, I think there'll be another announcement on the 20, 22nd of November to, to allow more. Uh, but, you know, that, look, the, the thing about this whole thing, uh, many agents that I speak to have been saying to me that, you know, they like it actually better because the, the buyers that are registering are genuine buyers. And, yeah. you know, if you've got 10 genuine buyers, um, you, you know, you're rubbing your hands. Um, and, and you just all the time wasters, the tire kickers, you know, the life suckers, you know, they're all gone out of the, the, the out of out of out of the market. So I think it's 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 really good for real estate. All right, Greville, you you have a role in the block. Tell us what that role is, and and do, is the block a, a a bit of an indicator, sort of like a a non industry indicator of the enthusiasm for property in Australia. You, you've been involved with it for some time. Or is it, or is it cons- consistently, uh, strongly, you know, supported? Look, I, 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 this, this is, I think, my ninth year. Um, I'm, I'm, I think all of us are finding it harder uh, this year to find buyers. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's particularly because of not being able to have hold the opens, talk to people. It's really this one-on-one thing. So I think. You know, we're, and we're always nervous about this time of the year. The auction is next uh, Saturday week, the 21st of November. Um, the statement of information, the asking prices are between 3.2 to $3.4 million um, each. Um, you know, that they could be rented for $25 to $2,700 per week. Uh, the tax depreciation, because they're new, is enormous. Uh, there's like $150,000 in tax depreciation the first year. Um, not that not that I'd ever recommend buying a property for you know, financial incentives or tax incentives, but the thing is because they're in Brighton this year, which is a very affluent Bayside suburb of Melbourne, uh, it, it's also going to get reasonable capital growth on top of all of those things. So, um yeah, look, it's coming together. It, 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 it's it's going to be interesting. Only having, I think, only seven registered bidders at each auction mm. is going to be different. There's normally fifty or sixty people in that room. And, um, and look, one thing I will say this year is the quality of these houses uh, is is as good of a, that I've ever seen. They are really high quality um, houses, and and I know that the, the Channel Nine, the block. Um, yeah, the, 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 each of those houses would have cost, you know, uh, replacement costs is like they're, they're like $4 million plus per house, land and buildings. Mm. Um, so the, whoever buys one is going to buy it at a discount to replacement cost. Um, so we'll see how we go. It's always, you know, five, auctioning five houses in one line mm. is, uh, is is you know any any estate agent will say they'll be nervous about that. Um, where will there be a pass in or not? Um, but of course, to have five properties to sell on one day, that means that you need a minimum of sort of you know at least probably ten 
to 12 bidders, some at a lower le level, some in, some in the middle and some that will carry the property to that higher highest point. So whether there or not there is that level of, of, of bidders, mm. that's going to be the question that we'll, we won't know until the 21st. All right, mate. Well, um, I, I taught Scott Cam many years ago, but I didn't teach him building. But uh, <coughs> he's, he, I think he's done a great job with that program and everyone associated with it has done a great job as well. Thanks for joining us, mate. And uh, we'll talk to you in a month or two. Thanks a lot, Peter.